Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have some housekeeping items uh, before we begin. Um, thank you for attending the uh, AI session. Uh, we have a distinguished uh, panel up here, those who are uh, very versed in artificial intelligence, so we're in for a treat today. Um, I want to remind everybody uh, to you know, sign up. This is MCLE, so you have to sign in and sign out. Um, the attendance and evaluation forms will be electronically uh, emailed um, by December 1st. Um, don't miss out on the, uh, updating your profile picture. Um, it's, it's around Ask Ann or uh, somebody from the bar. Um, and, and Ed was wearing a cape, and if you want to wear one of those capes instead of a, a mask, uh, talk to Ed about it. And then there's a drink uh, this afternoon after an MCLE. It's a, there's a, uh, a, a non-alcoholic uh, mocktail, so if you're interested in that, um, that's, that's at the cocktail uh, hour. So um, I'm going to introduce the panel uh, in the order that they're going to speak. Um, so, um, so on your left uh, is Mark Matheson. Mark is a solo practitioner. Uh, he just opened his own firm. Um, the, Prince, uh, he, the, the law office of Mark T. Matheson. Uh, he's a patent attorney um, in the electronic and computer software uh, area. Uh, prior to you know, founding his own firm, Mark was a partner at Patrick Townsend. Um, prior to that, um, to be an attorney, he was at Raytheon for seven years. He has an in engineering degree from uh, Harvey Mudd and his paintings from UCLA. Um, so after Mark uh, speaks, uh, Rob McFarland is going to speak. Rob is on the far uh, right. He's a partner at Hanson Bridges. Rob is a registered patent attorney, and he chairs uh, Hanson Bridges' uh, technology practice and co-chairs the intellectual property practice. His litigation practice is focused on patent infringement and licensing disputes, trade secrets, mis misappropriation. Um, he has a wide range of uh, knowledge and expertise in all areas of intellectual property. He has his JD from uh, Hastings and uh, an engineering degree from Stanford. Um, our other distinguished member of this panel is Warren Hodges. He's counsel at Hanson Bridges. Lauren specializes in employment law, but however, he is um, Hanson Bridges' um, lead um, on artificial intelligence, their, their task force. So, um, as Warren's JD is from Davis, and his undergraduate degree is also from Davis. So, everyone is well qualified, um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Mark. Thank you. I'm just going to stand up. Will the microphone stick me up if I stand and walk around with you not? Sorry, Sorry everyone who is listening to this right now. Can't hear anything from the sliding mic. Okay, so as Arthur C. Clarke once said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And we're dealing with something that kind of looks like magic right now. And what our job here in this room is to inform you enough so it doesn't look like there's so much magic anymore. Almost like a really neat parlor trick, but it's really expensive and it does, it does show, show some new stuff, so it's not exactly. What else? Yeah, it's already it's coming for us. So, uh, Joe, I, I used to work with this guy. He told me everything I know, so if I get something wrong, blame him. When I was in grad school, though, learning stuff before working with Joe, I worked on something called modern control theory. I was in aeronautical engineering, I was in a doctoral program, and I was studying essentially <laughs> diagrams like this. And if you think about what needs control, what, where there's a feedback loop, uh, all sorts of things. Airplanes, like I was studying, spacecraft, nuclear power plants, 
and things in your, your own house, like your thermostat, other things like you know, your washer, dryer, everything has some sort of little controller in it. That's what the electronics are when it fries out. Is. So thermostats kind of all work the same way, whether it's one of these old style Honeywells or your brand new Nest thermostat that you just bought from Home Depot, they work pretty much the same way. The end, uh, there's a desired temperature that user can put something, I want it to be 70 degrees. And then there's a little thermocouple inside, actually inside the unit there, it just measures. It's 68 degrees. And the two voltages come in there and they say it's negative two degrees, or two degrees, there's a two degree difference. The house needs to be two degrees warmer than it actually is. So turn on the heater. It sends a little voltage, the heater turns on, and it keeps on doing this so 30 times a second. And that's what happens. And it's real simple for one of these things, but not so simple for airplanes or nuclear power plants or you know, all of the other things that you have to deal with. Because sometimes there's multiple inputs and multiple outputs, and each one of them is kind of interrelated. Like the yaw and roll of an airplane, they're coupled, they say, they're coupled. So what ends up is you have a bunch of inputs, say four inputs for a rigid airplane, you have four outputs for a rigid airplane. Uh, airplane, and you have well, more than four, and you have to adjust the ailerons and the tail and you know, all this stuff. So I remember studying that, and some of us were thinking, there's a lot of math, a lot of linear algebra that I have to do for this control. Why, why is it so hard? Why can't we just have some thing just figure out, well, it's a little too cold, turn on the heater. When it's a little too hot, turn off the heater. I mean, to us humans, it's pretty easy, probably sit a baby in front of the controller and they could figure it out within a few hours, maybe a day. Well, we weren't studying that. They were studying this linear control theory that people down the hall were studying something called neural nets. We didn't call, them, we didn't call it AI. In fact, up until a year ago, you didn't say AI. That was kind of sci-fi and you know, Star Trek or, or whatever. You, uh, you would call it machine learning. So I still kind of call it machine learning. But we called the machine learning guys were down there, and they were just past the guys who were studying fusion. Remember fusion? Fusion is the energy source of the future, and it always will be. <laughs> and then there were the other guys who were studying beaming power from space. You now you can put up a bunch of solar panels, put it all into a microwave, and beam it all down. And those were just the dreamers. And the same with the people who were studying neural nets and these controllers. That you could just set in there, and it would kind of learn itself, and then figure things out. Let's skip ahead, 30 years, 25 years, to November of last year. ChatGPT was released by OpenAI Incorporated. OpenAI is a San Francisco startup. And this gentleman and I happened upon OpenAI a few years ago. We were going to a different client, but we, we, we kind of stumbled upon OpenAI in the building, and we looked in the glass windows of OpenAI, like, are we at the right place? And you can go there right now, too. Just take BART to 16th Street Station, walk east to 18th and pull some, and they're in this building. It was founded in 2015 by Elon Musk and other entrepreneurs who are all famous. And, probably heard some of them. and they went out and they thought, that's yeah, a bunch of money, and we can do some deep learning stuff. Let's hire the best in the business and go hire the best researchers we can. Now, Mr. Musk exited the company in 2018, but he Lots of people still associate OpenAI AI with him, even though he's more or less competitor with him. So OpenAI came up with some pretty cool stuff. It's, in fact, uh, they came up with something called GPT-2, which could run on any of your computers, maybe even your phone. It's pretty impressive. Then they came out in the middle of the pandemic with uh, GPT-3. It uses natural language processing to answer questions and translate. We're all figure, figuring out how to put them on our masks, and they're doing this. And then in 2021, DALI and some other image generating software came out. It can generate a digital image from natural language descriptions. You can tell it, I want a black cat flying on a broom at Halloween around you know, a cauldron, and it'll do that. And it's pretty cool, it's pretty impressive. And then, why we're all here today. It's because on November 30th, ChatGPT was launched with a free preview based on their engine GPT 3.5. Within two months, Microsoft 
saw the height, how good it was, and all these students who are now like putting out all these great papers, and maybe even more, or putting out all this good text. Microsoft invested $10 billion for over 10 years. If you've never seen ChatGPT before, it is not super sexy. It looks like, and this is it. So this is our family laptop, our family uh, iPad. It's got a bunch of rubber around it, you know, because it's a little bit hard on computers. And down here, you just type in something. Please, please write me a memo. Please send a letter to a friend, uh, her name is Wilma. Um, if you don't know what to type, there's four buttons here, and you can you know, suggest fun activities. Press that button, and it'll like lay out a plan for you for the day. That's all it is. It's, it's quite impressive if you've never used it before. So we've been dealing with assist voice assistants, Siri and Alexa. They use natural processing, natural language processing to interact with you like a human. You can ask it um, the orbit of Jupiter, and it'll tell you stuff back. It'll turn on and off the lights to your house. So I, I was thinking, like, what's different about this? What's different about ChatGPT? So I want to unveil a little bit of what it does. So ChatGPT is a large language model. And, well, GPT 3.5 is a large language model. What you do is you give it some text, and, it's, and it takes it, the text that you've given it and its response so far. And what a language model does is it just calculates what the very next word will be. That's all it does. And then it writes another word. And it takes your text that you entered before, the words that it's made so far, and then it just calculates what the next word should be. And that's all it does is just like putting all these words in sequence. Over and over and over again. And in order to calculate that, what that next word will be, it determines the highest probability words that would come next based on all the work, works of, of uh, text that is seen before. And from those highest probability words, and GPT-2 is 50,000 words, and it just calculate all these probabilities, and then it randomly selects one. And it has something called a temperature. You can dial it up, so it always takes the most probable word, or you can dial down the temperature, and it starts introducing other random numbers. So if I ask ChatGPT, like, how are you doing? How are you doing? It'll calculate, how are you doing? What is the most prevalent word that comes next? I, I am, I am doing. So if I ask, how are you doing? And it answers, I am doing. And then the next word, fine. Right? So that's all it's doing. Now, it cannot go into all the text and all, everything that is seen in the seconds that it takes to, to go and process your answer. So, and, and those are millions of words, web pages. I have here 17 trillion words, someone calculated. It cannot do that very rapidly. So what's done is if just a computer model is trained on those millions of books and web pages in order to estimate those probabilities in the real time. So, I mean, it, it can say, I'm doing fine, I'm doing okay, well, all right, great, spectacular, awful. You know, it, it can do all that, because it's seen all that before. What's the computer model? Well, what's been found to work with something called that neural net? Well, 25 years ago, those crazy guys who were down the hall, they kind of made this work. And in particular, they found something called a See. something with a bunch of attention heads, a transformer model that, that works. And it works so well that it's, it's, it's uncanny how it works. And I think the, the lesson on all of this is to learn is not that language is always like really, really complicated and it takes a human to do, but there's just kind of something, something behind it that's easier than we ever thought. So the computer model, the Artificial neural net, it just, it just goes and it just populates these probabilities. Again and again and again, it's a bunch of numbers. A large language model is just something that's been trained and trained a lot on like millions of points. So, what ChatGPT does is with that transformer model it has, it has it's calculating the next, the next word, 
because it's attention weights and it's going and it's figuring out based on all the words that it's gotten before, like what I should pay attention to. And there's like 96 weights or 96 attention weights, and it goes and it figures that out, and somehow that's enough. That's all that you need in order to make this quite, quite remarkable invention. And on top of that, the particular attention weight architecture that they use allows parallel processing. Normally, parallel processing just allows you to do things faster. But it allows you to do things faster, but it also allows you to do things that are not too good. So remember, we're looking at trillions of words, millions of books. And, and you know, I've got, got to train that. And it's going to take you 30 years to go through all that stuff. But if you can parallel processing, you can do that in a few months, which is what Dave had done. So ChatGPT, unlike Siri and Alexa, it just maintains this context, this attention, these different detailed words that you've already spoken, and kind of like a Seinfeld episode, where in, you know, at the beginning of an episode in Seinfeld, they have a joke about a cucumber in a, in a shower. And at the very end, there's a joke about a cucumber in a shower, and that's kind of how this works. And for a cucumber in a shower, that's important. And later on, it'll keep on referencing it, or it'll bring it up. And that's how we kind of carry on the conversation. So I, I, I try to say something different in cocktail parties, but every once in a while, my, my mouth is like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm not even thinking about it. And I suspect other people in this room have done before. But that's really what it's doing. Uh, ChatGPT can output this long form text that Siri and Alexa could never do. This text is complex, it's intertwined, like college level essays. And, Peter code and letters, it's very impressive. GPT. G is generative, meaning it can come up with stuff that's never been done before. AI that can come up with non trivial content like audio, images, video, software code. And in this case, we're talking paragraphs. P stands for pre-trained. It's just an AI model that somebody else has trained. Transformer, that's the thing that I was talking about then. The whole, it's a set of neural nets. They call it layers of neural nets, but layers are within neural nets. I'll show you a diagram. So we call it blocks. So there's multiple neural nets. I think they have like 20 or so. And they put them all together a certain way. Each one does kind of a different task. It divides the individual words into tokens. Actually, it's not dealing with words. It's dealing with tokens that are parts of words. And that's kind of how it works. And then the language model is something that determines into a common I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I, I know I must be done. So there's AI, so that's a broad, broad field. And then there's machine learning. And this is really where the science is going. And I would argue that if it's machine learning and the AI and all this stuff is kind of fantasy, or maybe there's something, I don't know. And then neural nets is a big part of machine learning. There's other things like fuzzy logic heard of it and other parts of machine learning, but neural nets is kind of where it's at. Transformer models would be a sub-part of neural nets. Different learning styles, but, well, I'm going to skip right to this reinforcement learning. The supervised learning, say I have a bunch of cat pictures, label them all cat, I have a bunch of dog pictures, I label them all dog, feed them into the, the model, and then this neural net will train itself determine what's a cat and what's a dog. And there's other ways, just throw in a bunch of pictures of animals and it figures out itself, like, hey, this animal is different from another animal. And then there's something called reinforcement learning, where this is what they did with ChatGPT. They, they, kind of, they trained it, and then they say, yeah, this was good and this was bad, and they kind of, like, at the end, give it some credit or, or there's a cost function. So this is what a deep neural net looks like. Well, we just diagram it. There's always an input layer, and the, what, this input layer might be like parts of text or words. And these words, they've got to be numbers, so they, they essentially make them into uh, vectors. And they say, well, this, is, this word is eagle. And um, there's some vector space out there that says this thing is more like a, an object that has permanence that can move around, maybe even an animal, and less like and maybe a little bit of freedom and patriotism, and less something like a hole in a donut. Okay, so like you have this huge vector space here called an embedding, and then you just feed it into this network, 
And each one of these lines represents an equation which is very, very simple. If you remember from I don't know, seventh grade algebra or, or something, it's like y equals mx plus b. Y equals mx plus b. And remember that the m is the slope and b is the offset. Those are just called weights and biases in here. And each one of these is an mx, y equals mx plus b. Y equals mx plus b. And you just add up all those and then and you go to the next one and the next one and the next one. That's all that's, that's, all that's happening. Then at the very end, you get something out of the very very end. And the way to train it is you do something called, um, well, similar to um, doing a least squares approximation to something. And it's just, it's just a bunch of math and mathematicians have figured out. You put it in there. And, and that stuff is from the 70s or later even early. So why is AI being kept popularity now? Well, computer resources, they were not, they, they have to be really intense for those neural nets. So for ChatGPT, there's 100, 3.5, there's 175 billion uh, parameters in it. And all of those have to be populated for the, every single word. And so you can't do that just normally. You've got to have some pretty fast hardware to do that. And now we have that. And as I'm, I'm finding on my own, on my own law firm, like, you, know, you can go out and hire lots and lots of computers for pretty darn cheap. And so you have these cloud resources site. You have all this data that's out there that people have been putting out on YouTube or uh, Enron or whatever. Like there's just a lot of stuff out there you can train. And then these mature ML algorithms. So that transformer architecture I told you about, that's from 2017. It's kind of a breakthrough. Not just, well, there was lots of stuff that kind of lead up to that. And uh, each one is a big deal. So before that was long short term memory systems and then GRUs before and add. And, but they're, they're kind of making some, some gains and trying to, to do what they're doing now. And the solution seems to work. So, you know, a college student or a high school student is able to cheat on homework, you have a product that's really nice. Uh, I think I might be out of time, so I'm going to skip the patent guy. So, and, and thank you, Mark. I know the, the, the magic of AI is so intended for somebody to think they're having just understanding that it's all telling us. But I think, you know, the, the description of Mark gave raises so many issues that were uh, presented by the intellectual property section. So, we're going to talk about some IP issues that are raised by that. So, you're thinking about this artificial intelligence model, all of the data that goes into it. So there's IP issues, who owns that data? Do you have to license that data? If you don't license it, are you infringing intellectual property rights? That's entirely nonsense of input. And then if you have an output, you know, all the brilliant things that ChatGPT or Dolly or these imaging programs come up with, who owns it? If you have trained your AI on the novels of John Grisham and your AI that spits out, please give me a novel in the style of John Grisham in Biloxi, Mississippi in 1998 in 212 pages. And ChatGPT does that. Are you infringing John Gershon's copyrights? If you train your ChatGPT on his corpus of knowledge, so you have that. And so the IP issues that are surrounding uh, intellectual property are, are, are really massive. Just, just, just put it in the context. So, you know, I, I say this recent questions and some. Answers. Don't have all the answers yet, they're still being developed. But to what extent can AI inventions be patented? AI can, can, can contribute some pretty interesting things. Can you patent it? But what, what if the AI comes up with an image? A painting? What would Rembrandt's next painting have been? And it spits out, having been trained on all of Rembrandt's paintings. What? He was working on these burgers in this city. He missed this one. That would have been the text painting. Dolly spits that out. Is that copyrightable? Can that be protected? Um, and then this is, you're going back to John Grisham, the train, you know, Sarah Silverman just the father of Austin Dominus. 
It's been trained on Sarah Silverman. Give me a monologue in the voice of Sarah Silverman. And it does. Does that infringe on Sarah Silverman? Did. Basically, throw off her brilliance, her funniness, and done it with AI. Um, so, those, so those are the issues that we're struggling with its IP layers. And we've had some help with some of these by an, an AI researcher named Stephen Thaler and his creation called DATS, which was his, his AI engine. And this went up to the Federal Circuit. Now, it, for non patent practitioners, the Federal Circuit is the Court of Appeals that has uh, exclusive jurisdiction over the appellate patent. And so, Thaler tried to get a patent on an artificial, two, actually two artificially generated inventions. And so the Federal Circuit was asked, can an artificial intelligence engine be an invention on the US patent? And it's more than just an academic question. If you look at patent rights, patent rights traditionally invest in the human being that invented the subject matter. And inventorship also creates ownership rights. So if you're an employee for Intel, you create a patent or invention, you own it. But your employment contract and employee handbook says any inventions you create during the course of your employment here at Intel belong to us Intel. So that's my contract. But the inventor, the actual inventor, has the ownership rights in the first instance. He has to assign it to another person, to their employer, to a corporation. Well, what if the initial inventor is an AI engine that is not a human being? Can that inventor generate an ownership right? If they can, if, the invent, if the, an AI engine invents something but cannot be an inventor, that's not protectable under the U.S. patent system. And so this became a very important question. And so, you know, the Federal Circuit opinion says, you know, we're not going to look at any metaphysical issues here. This isn't like, if you remember the, the episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where a researcher wanted to dissect the map with the commander data, the android. I see a few Trekkies in the room nodding. Um, <laughs> and Picard defended him, and Will Riker was put in a position of prosecuting deaths. He's nothing but an inanimate android. He can be dissected and figured out. I think that's sort of the measure of the man. And so the, the Federal Circuit Court of Business, we're not going to go into that. We're not going to look at the metaphysical issues of what artificial intelligence can and can't do, what it can or can't know, um, what its rights may or may not be. We're just going to go back to the statute. Thomas Jefferson, back in the 1790s, wrote for us this, this section. And it says, whoever invents any new and useful process, machine manufacturing composition driver. So the first word in section 101 of US patent code is whoever. And so the Federal Circuit, you know, said, look at that, whoever. So who, who reportedly invented this? Davis. Device for autonomous bootstrapping of unified science. Sounds very cool. So Stephen Thaler put in the record for the Federal Circuit. Davis invented it. Davis invented his inventions. What did Davis invent? He put under oath, I had nothing to do with this. This was entirely generated 100% by Davis without human intervention. And so what Davis, in theory, invented was a fractal container. So the idea is if you have a six pack of coke, you need know, the, 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 the six ring, the six ring container that you know, strangle a bird, they're not great, they're not great. So what Davis is really AI and you came up with this in fractal container. So it's a, it's a cup or a can or a container that has uh, outlines created by fractal geometry that interlocks with each other. So you don't need them, you just tie them together and blow them apart. So it's not a tremendous invention, but according to Stephen Thaler, Davis AI invention created this. It's a novel invention. It says for that. Davis created it. Davis also created, and this one never quite made much sense to me, and none of the other ones I've read on it really elucidated. So what it essentially is, is if you have a, a, a chaotic environment, like a fire, uh, lots of smoke, there are certain frequencies that the human brain will focus in on. And so if you can create an alarm signal that's close to that frequency, it'll grab people's mind and then follow the flashing lights out the woods. 
And so again, using fractal geometry, as Stephen Taylor said, once again, Davis, I had nothing to do with this. Davis used fractal geometry and calculated what that frequency is and matched the human brain waves. So now I have a very effective emergency. So again, Davis invented that too. But can Davis be an effective? And so the Federal Circuit again looked at whoever. Uh, it would be Davis, but can Davis be an inventor? And they just said as a matter of very dry statutory interpretation, that involved begins with whoever. And then they said throughout all the interpretation of U.S. patent law, a corporation cannot be inventor, a state actor cannot be inventor. In the first instance, each and every time, it must be the human being that conceives of a fact in such a matter. And so the Federal Circuit said, just as a simple matter of dry statutory interpretation, Davis cannot be an inventor. Davis cannot assign that invention to an inventor. And so if it's disclosed publicly, it's in the public domain, it cannot be protected under the patent system. And so that's what they asked about patent. Patent law doesn't recognize an artificial intelligence in patent law. So if you have an AI system, regardless of how brilliant it is, Probably have to keep what it creates a trade secret that wants you to disclose in the book and patent. And so Stephen Taylor, being a very active uh, artificial intelligence researcher, really wants to push on the edges of the law and determine where the edges are. Also asked the question can Davis, uh, a different AI engine, can this AI engine be the author of a copyrighted work? And so from AI to the roots of the mind. And so actually, Naruto teaches us the answer to this. Because you guys remember the monkey selfie case a few years ago? Naruto is a very handsome attack monkey. He used a wildlife photographer's camera and took this selfie. And it's a good selfie. I mean, it shows his piercing brown eyes. You know, it's like you know, somebody that's kind of off the wall, like thin, you know, kind of up to the side, smiling. I mean, that's a good picture. Naruto took it. A human being didn't take it. And Naruto like any other photographer, on the copyright on this song. And so the Ninth Circuit, actually, uh, uh, an animal rights group uh, ensued on the Rulo's behalf. And the Ninth Circuit just came out, I'm sorry, copyright, you have to have an author, and an author has to be human. You cannot have a non-human author. And so, thanks to the Rulo, the copyright office in the first instance looked at this picture. And this is a, uh, an image that they were created called Interesting Paradise. And it's a compositionally nice image. It's basically a rail spur going into a tunnel of flowers and plants. It's a very peaceful Interesting Paradise. And again, an AI engine created that. A human being didn't create that. If a human being had created that, there's no question that's a copyright for them. But the Copyright Office relied on Naruto. Very simple. There's no human author. This is not copyrighted. It cannot be protected under the Copyright System. And so, you know, because of Stephen Taylor, you know, you've, you've got simple answer to a simple question. If an invention is purely created by an AI, or can it be protected by a law? If you have an image or a work of authorship, like a novel, uh, created entirely by AI. AI. Can it be protected under copyright? It is not. That must have a human author. And so then the next question becomes, okay, what if you have something that's created partially by an AI and partially by a And so Zarya of the Dog answers that question for us. And so I don't know that she intended to do that, but she did that. So an author came up and created a graphic novel called, called Zarya of the Dog. And the author created all of these images with AI. So these are almost entirely created, artificially created images. But then the author took those images, arranged them into the, into the graphic novel, you know, curated them. Some are big, some are small, as a flow of the stories. And then she created the text. She created the text covers. And so the copyright office said, look, no, no human being author, no copyright, human being author, copyright. And so the, the copyright office said, the images themselves, no copyright, created by AI. But 
the author who used those AI images to create the graphic novel can have limited copyright protection in the compilation, the arrangement, the creation of the graphic novel, and the human being, and the human author. So I think that's really where you can go with, with AI created um, subject matter. If, like, back to the patent, uh, patent question, if you have a, uh, an inventor who's using AI modeling, huh? What if um, the artist or the author, um, you know, edited the images, changed the background mm -hmm. from blue to the pink, and, and substantially, you know, materially changed? The right, and, and, and in this, again, there was no, no image, and so that, those changes, then probably those changes are the subject of human authorship. And so the, the further you get away from the machine generated image, the more you can protect and copy that. But those works that human authorship is. Okay. And so that's kind of on the side of, of, of AI generated content. Yes? But is it known how much input Taylor had to provide to get? the patents out of the AI, or same question to him, because the people I know who, who dabble with conversion, they have just put a lot of input and manipulation, using words, but there's a lot of work that goes into getting it the way they want. It's not as simple as just saying entrance to paradise, three words, and then boom, it's done. So I wonder, is it known how much input, and I suspect they would have mentioned, they would provide a lot of input to the AI to purport to put it out. That way. Is it known that process or not really? And, and so the record in the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office when Taylor applied for the patents and then the record before the Federal Circuit, his uh, his oath was that he had zero input. It was entirely that that did that. So he kind of created that artificial record to, to determine this point. And to your sec second part of your question, the case law as of this day is regardless of the complexity of the uh, search engine engineering, or the uh, AI engine engineering, the crop engineering, it doesn't do it. The author of Zarya and Dawn had actually claimed that she spent months changing the prompts, fine-tuning the prompts. And so the analysis comes down to, if you are an artist using Adobe Illustrator, you're using software to create the image. You are the, basically the creative image, or the creative engine. You are using the software to generate your vision. AI, you are not. It is actually generating the content. So even if you give it prompts, even if you give it descriptions, it's if, an analogy it would be like if you are, um, if you're a manager of an, of an engineering department, so you know, we really need a software program that does X, X, and Y. I'm not a programmer, I just didn't need I'm going to go to my programmers and then they're going to do that. And so if you look at the patent law now, the engineer or the sales manager who generates the question, we need this, is not an inventor. The engineers figured out, are the inventor. And so from the patent law perspective, if Thaler types in this, I need a, a container design and can interlock and create that design. If, you, if you're working with human engineers, then the engineers can create that and you can be an inventor. So here, Dallas is on the vendor side of that, but they would be on the manager side of that. This sounds sort of silly academic. What is the commercial advantage for, for AI to be the author or the creator? Someone had to turn the goddamn machine on. So why, if, and, and someone started giving that machine directions, uh, why all the fuck why don't you just call that person the author and, and be done? In terms of authorship, so there's a concept called work for hire, but if you're a person, you know, and you're creating copyrighted work within the scope of employment, then presumptively the office can get an employer. But the issue here is they're saying that the case law says and the, and the statute say the original author has to be a human. So without a human author, there is no copyright. It doesn't vest in the first instance. And so when you sign the oath, you say, I am the first original inventor or the oath from the copyright copyright, say, I am the author. That's not a true statement that it's generated. Didn't the machine need some direction just to whether or not it was going to be era of the dawn? It didn't come up with era of the dawn. Right. And and the, the both copyright law and the, the copyright office decision on that and the uh, 
Case officers don't know the staff is not in the I am assuming for this that Congress could amend the statute. I don't know. And if, if you look that, does it, you know, the, the constitutional purpose of a copyright and patent law is to further the advancements of science and the use of models. And so the idea is you want to generate patents to protect inventors, to generate patents to uh, encourage research and development, to encourage companies to spend that money. And so you always kind of have a balance between two new patents and two new patents. And if you remember back, you know, beginning around the internet in 2000, you had a lot of public considered low quality patents come out of um, internet startups that can not practice entities spend the next 15 years doing that. So a lot of established companies said, you know, this is too many patents. It is too many. And so there is a debate right now that by extending the ability to patent or copyright, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence generating subject matter, you're expanding the number of patents, expanding the, the things that are locked up in patents by too much, you're actually undermining them, other companies' ability to create, uh, you know, useful, valuable, products. And so, that's kind of the output issue, I think, a few minutes now. And so the other issues have to do with, okay, and what Mark is talking about, we're training these AI engines on enormous amounts of data. And so if you're training them on copyrighted data, does the act of copying that trans that copyrighted data, putting it on your server, training your AI engine, is that a copyright? Is that an infringement of copyright? And then the output, I did the example of Sarah Silver, the example of John Richard. Things based on their their copyrighted works is that, and so it seems like almost every month there's a new major copyright lawsuit filed. So we've got Anderson versus Billy AI. This before Judge Arthur, Sarah Silverman's case against Open AI, Michael Strabon filed one. Um, earlier cases have dealt with the same types of things with the Google Books. Issue. So it wasn't AI, it was Google Books, or Google digitized ten million books. Is that a copyright? And so, what are the basic copyrights? Say, if you own a copyright, if you're an author that or a former or a musician that owns a copyright, what do you have the exclusive rights to do? And among those exclusive rights are to reproduce it, to copy it, to create derivative works. So uh, J.K. Rowling wrote <coughs> Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So she has the exclusive right to create the works of the movie, of the musical, a translation into German. Those are her derivative rights. And then also to display and distribute the copy of the book. So the thing we're talking about AI engine doing, what, how might the AI engine infringe that? Well, training data. You're copying that. So that, that may be a copy of the The output may be a derivative work. Create me a novel in the voice of John Richard Sack in a second of the sentence of the Richard And if, those, if that is a derivative work, just playing it, selling it, uh, promulgating it up in the those are all copyrighted. Uh, and so, what would the defense be? Those are the rights that but there's always, in other words, a copyright case, there's always the fair use of this. And so, what are the fair use of effects? It boils down to four factors. The purpose and character of the use. Is it commercial? Or is it transformative? Does it change the world? The nature of the copyright, usually factual or informational, or sort of given the narrow or fair protection of the fish. The amount of substantiality of portion that you can use. Have you copied more of the work than you needed to, to accomplish your priority goals? And then finally, the effect of the use upon the potential market for the power. So it was supplemented that copyright of the work in the market. And so, you know, we're not writing on a completely blank slate with AI. There's actually quite a few places that came before that have to do with taking copyright law and applying it to pretty complex technological issues. 
And so some of this had to do with software. There are two cases from the Ninth Circuit, one from 1992 and one from 2000. And I remember the Sony Computer Entertainment case had to do with a company called Connectable. But remember the original PlayStation back in 2000. Um, and so what Connect6 did, they took the operating system from PlayStation, copied it, put it on a PC. So PlayStation was its own machine. And so Connect6 said, look, we want to be able to, we want to allow you to be able to play PlayStation games on a PC or on a Mac. We want to make it so they don't have to buy some of the PlayStation. Or Sony was not really happy with that. And so the question here was, okay, if Connect6 copies the operating system, why to a PC? They copy exclusive rights. So by doing that, to create a virtual platform, then you can play Sony games on PC. Is that a fair use? And so what the Ninth Circuit said in that case, it was a fair use because the functionality of the software was not protected by copyright. And uh, Connectix was not just copying the producing the component to study the functionality of the software and to create an entirely different product. And so it's a transformative product. And so under those, you know, that's called an intermediate product. And so the Ninth Circuit said that intermediate property was no broader than it needed to be. Uh, it was necessary to create this transformative entirely separate product. So it was a fair use, it was something that not much. Uh, you know, another issue of fair use came up in Google, Books case. So Google partnered with a lot of libraries uh, in the Big Ten and the Pac Ten and the Pac Five and the Pac Twelve. Uh, but the major research institutions in the country and digitized about 10 million books. And so a lot of the books that were on the copyright scale say, what? You're copying my material, I'm digitizing it. Can't do that, that would be my copyright. And so, of course, they said, wait, this is fair use. And so the types of things that they were doing was preserving the library. So the digitizing, digitizing these works for the sake of preservation. They're on secure servers that can't be. They're not going to put out. But providing a full text search engine, so you can just set, you know, search for a spread, and it'll tell you what books. That's from the board system. That's all. You get the list of books. But it won't give you lengthy text search. It won't give you the title. So presumably, you can go out and find it. And finally, the next case would uh, provide you snippets. So you've got this word string you want. And it will give you just a very limited snippet around that word. So if you're searching Einstein, you can find a book that is not referencing somebody's dog named Einstein, but referencing Albert Einstein. So if you want to go to search further, then you know you can get that book about the dog named Einstein. And so the second circuit in this case said all those are fair uses under the fair use back of what grants are limited. It's not supplanting. Uh, the copyrighted books in the marketplace, and so there's no copyright protection. And so then, so we do have some case law that gives us some guidance on how the courts are going to do this. And some of the courts are beginning to look at this issue. Oh, I, I do want to, you can't have a fair use discussion right now without talking about this. So the Supreme Court, just this past term, had to look at fair use. And there's a very famous portrait of the prince that's painted. And Andy Warhol created a Prince series based on that, one of which was the Orange Prince, and it was the period in the magazine, Condé Nast magazine back in the so the Prince passed away. They wanted to reproduce that, so they got the Orange Prince, put it on the cover of the, of the tribute magazine. But the original photographer said, wait a minute, I licensed that for $100 to collect the whisper for it to be used once. And he just said, you know, this is way beyond the license. That's an infringement of that property. And so the Supreme Court looked at that, and kind of the big takeaway was, you know, the, the copyright holder, or I'm sorry, the, the magazine and the, and the Warhol Foundation. So like, this is a transformative news. Look at all the ways we've changed this age. We've taken, you know, kind of a vulnerable looking young prince, and we've made a very strong, iconic 
fly out in France. And they went through a lot of the silks. And the Supreme Court said, that's all fine and dandy, but you're misinterpreting what a transformer means. Transforming says a little bit of use about the content. And the use here is identical. The original photographer had licensed this to the magazine for the use on the cover. You're now licensing your transformed image for this exact same use put on the cover of the magazine. That's not transforming, that's the same. And so the takeaway of this case is, and the, the majority and Justice Kagan's dissent have a very different view on how broad this is. The majority says it's very narrow on these facts. The dissent kind of claims that this does away with copy at all using other artworks to be inspired by it. But so here it just it, it tells us the kind of the takeaway from our AI uh, analysis is to it, 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 we really have to look at the, the, the purpose of the quote unquote transforming these things. So are you creating a dark a novel in the style of John Bushing in order to John and so there's really two cases I want to kind of infancy with the same way we want to briefly touch on. The first is Anderson, stability versus nature. So this is in the Northern District of California. Here it has to do with a bunch of visual artists claiming that having the AI engine trained on their copyright images infringe their copyrights. And so just this past week, Judge Orrick issued a, uh, an order by and large uh, granting the motion to dismiss with the for that. And there were some factual problems with the parts of the complaint. Of the three plaintiffs, you can only sue for copyright infringement in the federal district court if you have registered an author. Two of the three plaintiffs in this had not registered copyrights. So that was dismissed. So some of the Ed rulings were kind of cleaning up uh, kind of factual problems uh, with the complaint. But there were two holdings, I think, of are instructive on where this area of the law is going to go. And he said, you know, at the motion to dismiss stage, plaintiffs have adequately alleged direct infringement based on the allegations that stability download or otherwise acquired copies of billions of copyrighted images without permission to create stable diffusion and use those images to train stable diffusion and cause those images to be stored at and incorporated into stable diffusion as a copies. So he's saying, on its face, that leads to the statutory requirement for pop, pop that work. Doesn't touch on whether or not it's fair use, doesn't touch on factually whether or not that's actually happened, the defendants say, no, I don't know that. But the judge said, on its face, this is a potential part of it. This is a potential The other kind of informative language in here has to do with the output. And so these are images. And so the idea is that you looked at William Van Gogh as a copyright. the copyright. Uh, you can say, give me an image of the skyline of San Francisco in the style of Vincent May. And it's a dolly will give you six inches. So if you do that with a copyright book, that image is not going to be substantially similar to any specific Van Gogh work. It's going to be an amalgamation. And so that's kind of where the, where the complexity of this case comes out. It's if you train your AI on 100 copyrighted images down after a lot of parties, then you create something that isn't substantially similar to any of those, but is recognizable in the artist's style. Is that sufficient for a copyright infringement? And in the, in, he, he granted the lead for a the artist that said he was not convinced the copyright claims based on the derivative theory can survive absent substantial similarity allegations. And so defense made a strong case that I should dismiss the derivative work theory without the utility because the plaintiffs cannot plausibly allege that output images are substantially discussed or represent protected aspects of the copyright trade. This is an image that's really going to happen. How similar are the images that are coming out of, like, of, of AI engines? How similar do they have to be to the training in order to, 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 to
I'm not sure I'm talking about it, but it's one other case that also came up. And I think it stands for the proposition that they're really, every answer of, you can't just ask, is, is training an AI engineer using copyrighted works a copyrighted work? Is creating output of an AI engine using copyrighted, based on copyrighted works a copyrighted work? I think there's not going to be one general I think it's going to be very nuanced based on the specific facts of the specific case. It's going to go into the data specifically what is this AI engine doing? What information is fed into it? How is that information used? How is the output generated? And so this is a case that actually hasn't gotten all that much press, but it's Thompson Reuters Enterprises versus the Bank. Uh, so, the issue here was that an AI startup wanted to create um, and basically an AI tool that you could type in real natural language please to it and spit out quotes from judicial opinions without any reauthoring, without any uh, basically a novel text to be generated, just in box and out of the But to do that, it had to be trained in a lot of system. And one of the things that's trained on, and one of the things that they used to it's up with were Westlaw headphones. Westlaw headphones are copyrighted. And so Thompson Reuters, who owns Westlaw, said, Look, you're infringing that copyright. Your AI engine is no copyright headphones. And so the judge, there was a motion for summary judgment, basically, to get by. And so the judge, it's actually a third circuit that judge sitting by a designation. Very, very lengthy relevance of the paper. Talked about the intermediate copying case law. And it said, really, all these, this is all going to happen with the jury. It depends on what's happening. And so, you know, relying on saying and so on, is this software just creating a permissible intermediate copy to create something that's outside of the scope of the And so, looking at the transformative, Question. So it, it was transformative in the problem if Ross's AI only studied language patterns in the headlines to learn how to produce judicial opinions. So I was Mark talking about is it just studying these boxes of text so it knows what the next word should be, next word should be, next word should be. So just basically machine learning the word sequencing the word patterns of judicial that's the case, this this opinion says it tends to only to one fair use. But he said that Thompson Reuters is right, that Ross used an untransformed text of headlines in its AI to replicate and reproduce the creative drafting done by Ross Hall attorneys. And Ross can't rely on the same copy cases where you're, you're taking that copyright or and you're replicating that copyright or any. The substantial similarity of the other issues of competition has to go to the jury, but as a matter of law, the goal is open to that specific trouble to get a copyright. And so I think with those cases, um, you know, there's just not going to be one answer for all of those. So as a practical matter, where does that be? You know, us to advise our clients. You know, if I have a client that says, I've given uh, my engine uses AI in general. And so I'm going to use it in our ad campaign and try to do our next um, detailed catalog and some chat and other Can I do that without the copyright law? And so what we say is that the law is uncertain. So this is really the right time. If you're using an AI that has to play with string, think of it as license. If it's license, so you're fine. That applies to it. Avoid the AI to be basic to God and stuff like this. And then if they can get pretty bad at that information if you're using an AI tool that isn't both a type of essay size and scale that can play their shoulders, put the risk on that AI for a bit of a problem. If they're not as going to do that, then they'll play how necessary it is to use that. I guess it's lots of questions, some answers, but I think over the next two or three years, a lot of this is going to be different. So, just to record a little bit. Now, 
Yeah, thanks, Rob. And I think that the last case that Thompson Murray's is a, a useful segue into what would otherwise seem to be a sort of choppy and disjointed presentation on my part. I thought I was going to have some years. There's a, there's a video feed up there. Uh, and so I'm actually here not to talk about anything substantive, but largely as a, a public service announcement to the group uh, of attorneys, because I think it's important that we start thinking about how we're going to use it in our practice. So if you were thinking about the Thompson Reuters case in the context of, well, wait, Thompson Reuters is doing stuff with generative AI, should I know about that? Yes, you yes, should. Uh, if, if I need to convince you anymore that artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence in general will impact you and your practice and your clients very soon, if it's not already, just think about email. People who think email is going to take off because it's this bizarre string of long letters that send stuff to places that we can't go. How are we ever going to trust that? Well, you can't operate that email. Yeah. The internet is a series of tubes that connect computers. We can't interact with uh, with our clients, we can't do our jobs without the internet either. I think this is where this is going, so if you wouldn't mind playing that clip, this will give you a sense of kind of how it's going to look in very rudimentary at this point, but it gives us a sense. There's a little play button that I'm going to talk about of what Thompson Reuters is doing pairing up with Microsoft. Essentially, what it's describing is a generative process. An associate got a directive from a partner, makes draft this contract, we need to publish quotes back. Draft this contract. Because of Thomson Reuters is developing its own generative AI product, which sits on top of Thomson Reuters' corpus of information that formulates Westlaw as we know it. How does that work? Don't ask me, ask after Mark. I have no idea. But because it does that, it can, it can create, as they've been describing, generative uh, text that didn't already exist in the voice of an attorney. And it can also cite to the... That's a good picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was generated by... Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 20 years old. I don't know, I mean... Yeah. How does it work? I have no idea. I, I became the, the head of our AI task force because I know anything about how AI works. I have no idea. You have to ask Rob and Mark. Uh, but because when ChatGPT 3.5 came out, I typed in some employment law questions. That's my practice area. And I was blown away by what it provided me. And that was right when it came out. And it's only gotten better. It was wrong many respects, absolutely. But now, they're taking the same technology and they're putting it into more trustworthy sources in a couple of different ways. Now, among the things, among the things that it's being used for, legal research. So this comes from Law Vision. Law Vision is a consulting firm for a variety of, of, of uh, legal applications, among which is artificial intelligence. And they surveyed about 40 firms nationwide, primarily mid-sized, a couple of slightly larger than mid-sized firms to ask them, what are you doing with this stuff right now? And right now, most 
the most basic function in this legal research on, on some of these products that are now coming out, and I'll show you a list of some of them. Uh, legal research, low, lower level drafting document summaries by communications. Where we're seeing, what we are going to start seeing more and more are, are companies, both large and small, that are going to start using these generative AI concepts to either do largely one of two things. One is to uh, one is to allow you to use their existing products, so familiar products like Lexus, um, Case Text, which some folks have used Case Text. It's largely a litigation-based software. Uh, but Case Text was just purchased by Thomson Reuters. Case Text developed their own generative AI product. I, I, because our firm is looking at how we're going to integrate this stuff, and I think everybody here should at least be thinking about it, we got a demo from Case Text, and, and I, there isn't a good demonstration beyond this one that I'm allowed to display publicly. But it does largely what you just saw in the, the, the Thomson Reuters product. That is, you can ask it a, a, a prose-based query. Uh, what are the elements of a patent infringement case? And instead of getting a long list of, of cases that you now need to sift through, it will give you in narrative fashion, it will generate uh, an answer that can be in the style of either a, you know, some kind of persuasive writing for a brief, uh, it can be an ex explanatory writing to your client, it can be in an email to a partner, and it will populate with highlights to the actual source material that it is quoting for the citation or the propositions that it's giving you in narrative fashion. The, um, the, the, the various companies that we're seeing coming, coming up to try and harness this technology and sell it to us take one of two forms. One is you can have a subscription-based uh, uh, relationship with, for example, Lexus. Uh, Westlaw has a, a product called Precision, which will then turn into a product that they're calling their Westlaw Edge AI. Now, those things are not cheap. They're subscription-based, and they're usually per attorney, and they modify the pricing per attorney. Now, those, those products are not available yet. In fact, we've tried to beta test them, but they won't even let anyone other than the biggest law firms even beta test them. They're, they're keeping them under wraps. They're telling people that this stuff is going to be available by the end of the year. I'm not buying it. But that's what they say. The benefit of that is its generative AI sits on top of the corpus of, of data, cases, and treatises, you know, all the source material available to Lexus, available to Westlaw. How? I don't know. You have to ask Rob and Mike. The other part, the other type of this, uh, is the example Harvey and then these smaller guys, and they're smaller because they're startups. Harvey is an investment by OpenAI who created ChatGPT that's specific to law firms. And instead of sitting on its own corpus of, of information, the way Lexus and, and, uh, and Thomson Reuters do, they will sit their AI stuff, and I use the word stuff very technically, you'll have to ask Rob and Mark what that actually means, on top of your own internal law firm information. So instead of you having access to Thomson Reuters, and, and Lexis, or the internet writ large, and the chat GPT, it's contained. All that information is contained to whatever you have in your firm. So, so all of the thousands of briefs that you've written, the emails, everything that you get access to, it's contained within that closed system. But now, you can do generative-based AI stuff the way you would with chat GPT. It also does other things, so it can integrate with your email. So if you wanted to draft an email for you, you can say, write me an email in the voice of X. Or you can say, you know, I, I need to do a writ of attachment. Please create a writ of attachment for me. And it will go through your own internal law firm versions of this stuff, and it will generate something for you. Those are in the variation stages. Um, the, the bigger guys, yeah. So this said, would it be able to do well, theoretically, uh, they're not there yet, but 
For example, if your name is associated with documents, and if the metadata of that document, uh, if, if, the, if the AI has access to that metadata, you, yes, you can make sure that it's only pulling from your source material. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. One is you either need to know exactly, you need to be very, very comfortable with the third party that you're contracting with to do this, or you need to do it in-house. It is almost impossible to do it in-house at, at a scale that's going to be you know, permissive for small and mid-sized firms. I mean, only the huge guys can hire engineers at hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to maintain this stuff on a regular basis. Can any of these systems use any form of what I call legal reasoning or judgment, rather than just uh, blurting out whatever, whatever you find sort of matches the parameter? No. Uh, the, so, so the, the, the systems are, are trained, and that's the technical term that they use, they're trained. What does that mean? I don't know. You have to ask Rob and Bob. But it is, it's a, it's a process of uh, predicting what the next word is going to be the same as what Mark described earlier. But what these guys will tell you is they use this, what I find to be really a noxious term called iterative. They say, well, it's an iterative process, as though that's supposed to be a selling point. All that means is you, the lawyers, are going to have to train it. Right? So we're going to take that tech, we're going to put it on top of your stuff, you do a bunch of things with it, lawyers, and if you like it, you give it a thumbs up. If you don't, give it a thumbs down. We're going to call that iterative as opposed to taking your turning time to try and train a technology that we hope is going to work. What kind of numbers are you talking about? Uh, Lexus. And I have Lexus, because of course the whole lot of money, 250 million a month. Uh, but I have some very valuable research tools that I have accumulated over the last 25 years. And uh, the trouble is, I, I don't know where to look for it all, but if I have it in this chat box or Harvey, wherever the heck it is, they might be able to get to the stuff and really quickly. And what's it going to cost them? Well, you might be surprised to hear that they don't want to let everybody know what the pricing is going to look like. <laughs> they want to reel you in first so that you see the product. They say, don't worry, you know, just, just let us give you a demo and then we can talk pricing, which is, we have, I've never gotten it. Probably straight and stuff other than the big guys, which they're more ranges than anything else, and their size is. I'm sure everyone's had to know you know, clients are used to documents to being subject to it, so for that request, and they also hand over all the emails that you've sent them to sort of bring them to them to the well, One thing, and I've beta tested a few of these for some of you about this on the screen there, it seems to me like if you give them access to your system, especially if they're small, they don't really have a good way of telling you how how you need to sort out the attorney client privilege stuff from a large number of model system, especially if you already have your internal system integrated. Have you heard anything about that? Well, remember that that really obnoxious word iterative? Yeah, use, yeah. That's the catch-all for we don't know, but let our engineers go in and play around with your stuff and we'll figure it out. That's my interpretation of it. How does that work? I don't know. You're gonna have to ask. Following. <laughs> <laughs> On Jerome's question, well, you know, what if you, you use some of these things and you're putting in trade secret material, you're putting in very sensitive private data? You know, I think the laws on privacy aren't, aren't clear yet in terms of this generative AI. Do you know more Jumping about that? ahead, it's an excellent point. We're going to be talking about ethics, which is why I've been diligently checking my, my, uh, my time to make sure that I don't run out of it. I will say, that when you get these demos, you'll get the demo first from a salesperson. It'll be virtual. They'll show you all the cool iterative stuff they can do, and then they'll send you, you know, their version of a contract that plays out. I mean, it's, there, there are there are vast provisions, both you know, in terms of identity, in terms of who's responsible for what. These companies will tell you, look, we pride ourselves on safety, data security, and data privacy, because without that. We're no better than just OpenAI's ChatGPT product, right? So they, they are very strong on selling that. But I would look through some of these contracts. If you decide to go down that path, number one, find somebody trustworthy, good reputation. I think these smaller guys are going to start dying off anyway. That's just my prediction. The bigger guys just already have the infrastructure, hundreds of lawyers, 
the, the product test, the hundreds of engineers to make sure that it works. I, I don't see how the smaller guys can compete. I could be totally wrong on that. But you've got to get somebody trustworthy and you have to read the contract language, especially if you're going to do what a lot of people are starting to do. It's a good idea to set up what they call a sandbox, which is just a secure area where you can start testing this stuff just to see how it works, just to make sure that, yes, our data is secure, uh, our data is private, and if it's not, you third party jump and they're going to have some other uh, I think uh, that's going to be a good segue into what Mark's going to talk about. Thanks, Mark. Speaking of, very good question from the. That's good. So now on to ethical issues of using AI. You are between a rock and a hard place. I'm going to tell you why we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. It's not too much of a rock. Not too much of a hard place. Um, and I'm not going to start this lecture by you know now that we've shown you how to do it. Don't. <laughs> that's sex ed. That's. High school. <laughs> I'm going to show you why we must assess AI, generative AI, as lawyers. I'm going to identify California rules of professional conduct that are applicable, including competence, managerial and supervisory lawyer responsibilities, confidentiality, including implied authorization. You might, have, you might think you have some implied authorization. Communication with clients, informed consent. And then I'll sprinkle in. Uh, some best practices here and there. So here's the rule of competence. No ethics step lecture would be complete without me reading from it. So I'll just start here. Rule 1.1 competence. A lawyer shall not intentionally, recklessly, with gross negligence, or repeatedly fail to perform legal services with competence. Now there's a comment in the California Rules of Professional Conduct that says that we must keep abreast to the changes in the law in its practice including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Uh, relevant technology. And the ABA model rule, comment A, is it's the same language down there. So, uh, relevant technology, is this really relevant? Yes. Our, yeah, we as lawyers, we output long-form text. We give legal opinions. And what does ChatGPT and these other generative tools do? They do the same thing that we do. So this is darn right, very relevant. So we've got to keep abreast of the technology of generative AI. We've got to understand, I think we have to understand how to use it appropriately, maybe. And we have to assess it for legal work. And that might be even if we say, I'm going to retire next year and I don't care. And, or I'm not going to use it right now. I'm going to let the heavens, the big firms, waste their money on Westlaw and all that. Or um, I, you know, I'll, I'll piggyback off of their associates when they come and work for me. Um, to me, generative AI seems like less like digital currency and more like a predictive coding and e discovery. But I'll explain that. Digital currency. As a practitioner, if I decide I don't want to have anything to do with Bitcoin, you've got to pay in cold hard cash or from an American bank or get wire transfer for normal funds, then I can do that and I can get away with it. Predictive coding. You can probably do that for a while and say, like, I'm going to hire some associates to look for all these, these uh, files that we have. I'm going to look through the files myself. I'm going to do everything old school. But at some point, I'm going to have somebody on the opposite side insist on it, maybe convince a judge, or the judge is going to be familiar with predictive coding, and, and I'm just going to have to know how to do it, or I'm going to have to like, be involved in it somehow. So that's why I say it's less like digital currency and more like something that we're going to have to deal with at some point. And it might be useful for us to spot the use of generative AI by somebody else. Whether that somebody else is the opposing party, we are useful, or our own staff, or our own associates. So, issue spotting for generative AI. There's issues involved in using it, and this is all part of confidence. So, generative AI often, often gives inaccurate, incomplete, unreliable responses. But its answers look so good. So good. I'll get in. There. Um, information uploaded to generative AI platforms is public, or to um, the, the public platform. Like ChatGPT, if you don't get an account right now, it's public. I'll get into that. And then the last one, I just want to bring this up. 
Security surrounding generative AI platforms is uncertain. You know, all these people, my mother, like, logging in. I don't want to pick on her, but I'm going to pick on her. So she logs in and she's trying it out. And that draws the flies. That draws all the bad actors who are going to exploit sensitive data. And who knows, maybe some of those, black, those bad actors are sitting right here. So, uh, <laughs> So back to competence, I already read that. A rule, you know, we need to be competent as well. Chat GPT hallucinates. Some answers are just wrong. Some are incomplete. And it can plagiarize others and copy copyrighted material. A lot of blogs present. It's very wide open. Now, it's also biased as a result of its training purpose. The internet, oh, the internet has everything, right? The internet is not everything. It's mostly an English language, mostly, I mean, came out of the United States, and, you know, there's a certain kind of bias. So, uh, you know, we as lawyers always have to look for that, and this is one of those things where I might be trained on everything, but it's only the universe that we know. And last I checked, the, the internet has some pretty pious people on it. There, uh, so this last bullet is the scariest. There are absolutely, well, I put absolutely no good answers to that because there's a little gray text below that does over that place. There are absolutely no indications of any of these problems in a chat GPT conversation. And I'm going to talk about chat GPT because that's what I'm most familiar with. Chat GPT states things very confidently and it will defend itself when making stuff up. And the user, my mother, is completely unaware of it. So, here is, here's something that I found on the internet, somebody posted this. So, there is a, um, somebody, oh, there's a product by OpenAI where you can put in your own PDFs. And ChatGPT will look at your own PDFs and then you can ask it questions. It's called, like, ChatPDF or something like that. So, somebody put in you know, some documents that they wanted to look at. And then they asked some questions about it, and it had something to do with like ammo lens. Let's see that. So ChatGPT came back, and this is earlier in the studio. ChatGPT came back with something about a lens. And this lens is in the document. And so the user, the user, that's where I start here. The user starts in this black, this blue text. There is no mention of the lens type in the document. ChatGPT writes. Rob, well, so I'm going to read the slide. I apologize for the confusion. Upon reviewing the document again, I realized I made an error in my previous response. The document does mention the type of lens used in the camera, which is a Leica DC Vario L Mark lens, page 19. So the, the user knows better, but it isn't mentioned in page 19. He writes, where did you get this information from? ChatGPT response, I am an AI language model, and my responses are generated based on the text provided to me. In this case, the, provided, the, the information I provided was sourced from the PDF file that was mentioned at the beginning of our conversation. Now, the user knows better. The information about the lens is not in the document. Where did you get it from? And finally, it capitulates. I apologize. Please disregard my previous response. <laughs> Just think if you're doing some legal question and you don't know it, you know, can't look for that. So, that confidence. You're going to use, if you're, if you're going to play the game, then the attorney, an attorney must proofread everything from generative AI. Must proofread it, of course. Check every citation with an independent source. There's a couple of New York attorneys who got in trouble because the guy wrote a brief and he turned it in and he had done his diligence. He thought, ChatGPT like cited some cases and he asked ChatGPT, did you, you know, where do these cases come from? And it made stuff up. Those cases didn't exist. Check other sources to determine completeness because it might be A, B, and C, it might, there might be a D left out. And then you've got to step back as a lawyer and critically assess everything. And that's true. The part where I'm going to start here, I mean, these things are not your brain. Each large language model has seen more words and legal books in cases and treaties that any of us will ever see in our lifetimes. And they output text uncannily like a, like a really bad assistant. <laughs> uh, but they cannot think. The, the, my first portion on, on what is AI, they cannot think 
And they certainly cannot think or make a decision like an attorney. So artificial neural nets are only loosely back, uh, based on connections between a brain's neurons and axons. What's your question? Oh, sorry, go ahead. So, I'm listening to all of them. What strikes me is that the soul is practically because it's just going to be too expensive for the people who are acting uh, this tech box and the systems. And you're going to have to rely on the stuff that we've all been relying on over the last 25 years. You have to do stuff for ourselves, you would do it for the rest of the world. We want to be able to use, you know, the, the system of the top, like, that you use for warranties for uh, like carbon. I mean, we're not going to be able to pay for it. No way. I think what I've been saying is cautioning people against using it, and I've mentioned nothing about cost. I, I, I'm not accusing you of any more. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, I, I, I feel the practitioners are out of business. In fact, this is why solo practitioners are going to do quite well, because the heavies are going to mess up. Um, and here's another way that non solo practitioners are going to mess up. The responsibility of managerial and supervising lawyers. Part C, a lawyer shall be responsible for another lawyer's violation of its rules and the state law. If the lawyer orders or with knowledge of relevant facts and instances of conduct ratifies the conduct involved. So, if you say in your firm, hey, go ahead and use some chat GPT, then like that guy out in New York. I mean, there's two guys in New York. One guy who actually typed stuff in and did the research, turned in the brief, and then his managing partner, or the partner, had nothing to do with it, and that guy is pulled into court as well. So as a solo practitioner, I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> same thing with non-lawyer systems. Same, actually, the same language, I'm not going to. So, best practices, I would think, instruct all of your subordinates, attorneys, Anybody uh, who's not an attorney working for you, the choice of whether to use generative AI for substantive or sensitive work, you can go ahead and write to their boyfriends or their girlfriends or whatever. Well, the substantive or sensitive work belongs to the supervising attorney. And then, if they decide whether, uh, if you decide or if the supervising attorney decides that it's going to be used, we should decide what are the inputs going to be and to what extent. And they can delegate some of the written client consent to an attorney. I wouldn't delegate that to a paralegal. I wouldn't dare delegate that to uh, a non-lawyer because there's some, you know, some other issues that I'll talk about later. And then determine how to check the output from generative AI, AI how to exercise their independent judgment and decision making. You probably need some sort of policy in a firm to say this is how we're going to check stuff. And so. A lot of the costs, and a lot of that, you know, just type in this and press this button, and boom, you're going to do a, you know, a month's worth of work in a day, and that's all going to be mitigated by this check, check, check. Imagine you have a really bad associate, it's very, very confident, and you have to check and double check and everything, or you're really saving much time. Confidential information: a lawyer should not reveal confidential information to apply anything that you type in. ChatGPT is that they can use it, it's not confidential. Now there's this portion in model rule 1.6. I couldn't find this in the California rules, but I'm, I'm sure there's something. The disclosure is impliedly authorized to some in order to carry out representation. And there's some other uh, language like that as well. Like, you know, a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of uh, uh, unauthorized access to information. I mean, there's, well, Let's stick with this impliedly authorized. The lawyers or clients come to us, we're the experts. Why should they tell us to use word perfect or word? Or chat GPT or not? Well, data shared with chat GPT is retained to train the model further. It's not done in real time, but they even said they say on their website when you do use our non-API consumer services like chat GPT or DALI, that's the image generator, we may use the data you provide to us to improve our models. So right there, you know, you're on notice. Anything you type in there, it's not public. And Samsung found this out the hard way. Their employees, I mean, they're great employees, I would think. They pasted confidential source code in the chat to check for errors. 
They're in their own room. They got ChatGPT, they type it in there, check this for errors. Another one shared code to uh, request code optimization. Another one shared a recording of a meeting, burden to meeting notes. I mean, these are employers, employees who are using the latest stuff, it's just they kind of got themselves in the trouble. So, as lawyers, are we impliedly authorized to go ahead and use ChatGPT? Generative AI tools that are publicly available. Well, large companies restrict or ban employees from using generative AI on sensitive data. And that includes Apple and Samsung, of course, and Spotify, Verizon. These are just any corporations. These are ones kind of in the know. And then banks. I mean, attorneys, we deal with confidential information all the time. Banks deal with confidential information all the time. The list of banks goes on and on of uh, banks that um, are banning or restricting employees from using generative AI. And then retail, Amazon, kind of a tech company, and Walmart. And then schools. Schools are banning the use of generative AI, but mainly to, to prevent cheating. But the largest school districts in the nation, the New York City Public Schools, the Los Angeles Unified School District, they're just outright banning it. Foreign colleges, banning it. U.S. colleges are mainly like, well, we'll leave it to our professors. <laughs> Uh, for the restrictions by these other companies, are there other either than the other? I think employees have a close one. I don't mind what the companies themselves have a close one. So, anyway, from the corporate world, from academia, we're being told, no, there are restrictions, are not, this is not just Microsoft, we're going to get to the spot. So I think this might be one of the last. Duty of confidentiality, obtain uh, client written consent, that's the golden get out of jail part. Uh, or use Car AI or one of these tools and just pay a lot of money. And this is what those other large firms are going to do. Pay a lot of money and they're going to make it work. Communication with clients, here's the last thing. We have to give informed consent. When you're giving informed consent, tell the client. You're waiving attorney client privilege. Maybe they're fine with that. May violate some privacy and data protection laws if there's a third party, or if there's an employee, there might be some employment law concerns. Terminating any trade secret protection, and by the same vein, you uh, um, may put some hats at risk. And you may violate export control laws on certain stuff because even though the servers are based in the US, they're marked foreign, foreign nationals who may be look, working for these companies. Actually, when we went to OpenAI, we were looking around. Yeah, a lot of like young 20-something white guys, a lot of women, uh, a lot of Indian guys. A lot, I mean, there had to be a lot of foreign nationals in there. That's all I'm saying. So you probably like to, you are violating export control laws if there's something sensitive like that. So with that, if the client's all fine with that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We're gonna have time just for some, some questions. Any questions? Um, for Lexus and Tomkin and Lawyer by Claw, you're not giving up. Not not it's not going to open. It's not like opening out a chat with people for certain things that we can talk about. So that's a way that you can be violating a lot of privacy rights. I'm just gonna go. So the question was, when you upload, when you upload material to Lexus, uh, Lexus is an AI product, does it can it presumably client client information for product? You're working on it for you. Right. The the containment of Lexus and, and Westlaw, their their products is the same as you would be doing if you were just doing an existing type of research uh, product. Um, so insofar as you would use, you know, 
you were to search your own client to see how they previously been sued for patent infringement or have they defended or filed a demur or patent infringement case, most of that is already being drawn on public information anyway. Now, insofar as you, there are there are case, there are brief analyzers. Okay, so you can upload your brief to your attorney and work product, which presumably includes things that you're going to file publicly. To the extent that you would do that on those brief analyzers, or if you were going to be site checking things, you have the same reporting to these companies. Now, again, you've got to, got to get in there and see what they're offering. According to these companies, you have the same protections as you already did with, with Lexus and Thomson Reuters. And so whatever you were doing before, you can still do. So now you get a generative response. It's, it's not going any further outside the parameter. Any other questions? All right, thank you.